Hey Throners, it's Kyle here, Azora Hype with another hype video, and this is an exclusive interview we had with Paula Fairfield, the sound designer for Game of Thrones. She had some absolutely amazing energy, and basically all of the questions that got answered had about four to five minute answers, and she went off for almost 10 minutes on her questions. So we were really lucky, and we were very fortunate and had a great time interviewing Paula. This is the first part of the interview, and uh, basically we are really excited that you guys are enjoying the vlog now if you haven't subscribed to the channel make sure you do so there's gonna be awesome vlog videos coming out over the next two weeks and we got to remember that season seven is coming and i will be dropping a lot of wildfire content including reviews collaborations and all sorts of other stuff so make sure you subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click that notification bell now enter the interview i went to algonquin college in uh, in ottawa that was pretty fun yeah right. What did you study there? I studied small and medium business enterprise management. Yeah. Originally, I took I took a, a first year. I uh, I was like, I knew the city was beautiful, and, and uh, my friends had moved there a year previously, and I, I kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wanted to get, actually wanted to get into radio broadcasting, to get into that, but uh, I decided. I mean, the job, the job, the success rate coming out of college to get a job in that specific field is very very low, almost like eight percent. I decided to go, at least try to understand how business works. Yeah, that's good. I wish I had done that. Alright, well it is 2 o'clock so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we will start down here, and um, move across, and then we'll just start until uh, about 2.25. Uh, so, uh, so we're uh, just getting this up. We're good. There you go. So uh, Kyle here from Azora Hype. I think uh, I can speak for everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, really excited to have you here. Um, you described your job as making weird sounds. Now, uh, I bet some are more challenging than others, but what's your favorite and most fun sound to make? Um, whatever is the next newest thing that I have to conquer, you know? I mean, it's, you know, working in sound is like a, a, an endless treasure trove of, of play, if you allow yourself to go there. And I think as my career has, you know, evolved, um, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time, so you kind of get to a place where, you know, I've done a lot of different things, and I've worked on every genre possible, and because I, I love every kind of sound there is, you know what I mean, so I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm attracted to that, and, and, and now I challenge myself with different kinds of stuff, um, you know, I will, uh, if I, if I'm starting, you know, even with Thrones, I mean, you know, we're, talk, we're here to talk about Thrones, I can talk about that specifically, but, um, with, the, with new locations or with new ideas or with new creatures or whatever it is, you know, uh, um, comes um, a lot of research um, to, uh, to dig deep and find the nuggets and real special stuff. And I don't use any synthesized sound at all in my work, none of it. Because I, my, my, my theory of sound and, and work is that, um, you know, if you start with an organic source, you'll end with an organic source. If you start with a non-organic source, you produce something that has zero soul and zero heart. You know, my, my theory of it is that um, whatever you take will maintain the essence of it all the way through the process, no matter how much you twist and turn and flip it and stretch it and, and all that stuff. There's something that still speaks from its original source. Not that the person listening to it knows what that source is, but there's something very primal in it. And a good example of that in Thrones is a funny thing that happened at the very beginning, which was in terms of, because I came on in season three, mm -hmm. and the dragons, for instance, were toddlers, so, you know. Uh, and finding Drogon's voice in particular, because Drogon is the lead dragon, to find the specialness of him. And it was a long exploration for me <coughs> To, because essentially what I'm creating with the, with the dragons is a, I'm creating a performance. I'm crafting a performance. I'm not physically doing it, but it is that in a, in a way. I mean, these are characters. I, I have I, I have a background character feeling for each of the each of the dragons, for instance. For the White Walkers, I've got a background, you know, the street that you know, for me, and finding the special things that define that that will live. Because the other crazy thing about Thrones is, and I have never, and I don't know any other show like this. I've certainly never encountered this. I have to grow my sound design for dragons. That is not something that I've ever experienced. I mean, they, they, you know, for me, 
they went from toddlers to, you know, now there's like the size of 767s and they're gigantic. Mm -hmm. But you need to always recognize Drogon, for instance, when you hear it. You need to know, and you need, like, they all have to carry their sound all the way through, but it has to get bigger and badder. And as they get bigger, you can hear more of their detail. And their voice needs to come through and be very, very clear. So one of the examples, and I've talked about this in interviews, you may have read this, is that I searched and searched for the sound for Drogon as a beginning sound to get his character. And I hadn't fleshed out in my mind who he was yet, but I remember it was one of the early, the first uh, sessions I had with Game of Thrones when I first came on, and I remember Greg Spence, who was, he runs all of our post productions, a brilliant, brilliant man, and he is the mechanical brains behind how they actually can shoot and do all this spectacularness. You know, I, 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 I've often said I wouldn't want to live in this party because I don't know how he does it. And he, he's the guy who slices everything up and figures out how it's shot, where, and how, you know what I mean? And then continues on through post. And I remember he's the guy who will say to me always, you know, I'll present something. So good about it. It's like I nailed it. You know, I know it's not special. It's not special. It's like, God damn it. You know, so I will go back and look and hunt. And that first session, I I was so I was a little pissy about it. You know, like I was like, really? Because that sounds pretty spectacular, and I had worked so hard on it. And he left the room, and, and he said, you know, let's see what you can come up with. And I was like, well, you know, it's early on in the process, and you're trying to like prove yourself. You know what I mean? And so I sat there and I started thinking, and I, I swear, yeah, okay. So I was like, "Fuck you!" Right? <laughs> and I ended up somehow to finding two turtles having sex. Mm. Fuck you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, but the the moan of the male was became the purr for Drogon. And the funny thing about that is, is that her has stayed to this day. It's part of his own laugh of openness. But the funny part was, I, I actually enjoyed I remember playing it for Greg, and he lit up, giggled. And from then on, I, they, they never asked me to come in for spawning sessions. They just send me the stuff and let me just cut me loose and do my thing, and then they'll comment, you know? But because, and so I knew that that was part of it. So I always look for that. So. Every season, every new scenario, you know, 502, for instance, the second one in, in season five, when he comes down off, and it's the first intimate, real face-to-face -face intimate moment with them. You know, during that, I came up with some new qualities to, to help you lean in, to help you really connect with the dragon, you know what I mean? And, and whatever that is, whatever the qualities, and, and, you know, they come from different sources, but it's always finding that thing that will connect with the viewer, that might make you smile for a minute, and you don't know why you're smiling, you don't know why you're giggling. I watch people giggle over that scene, and they don't know what they're responding to. But they love it, because there's something in it, there's something about it. And that's, for me, that's the high, to find that. So that would be my favorite sound always, whatever that ends up having to be for that scene. And when you find that beautiful nugget that people respond to, I mean, it's, it's like the best high there is. Because it's, it's, you know people are going to connect, you know it's going to bring a smile, or make people cry, you know, whatever it is, evoke an emotion. And for me, as somebody working alone in a dark room by myself all the time, knowing I'm connecting with everybody who watches the show in that moment, it's really powerful for me. I th you know, my, uh, I'll end this quickly because I know we've got to get to other questions, but one, the one sound that stood out to me is when the Night King turns his head. And it's just like, I don't, I don't know why, but it's just like, that sound, it's just like, it's frightening to me. And I'm like, whoa, but because we, we, we don't hear him say anything. So, uh, beautiful job on the show. And, well, the, yeah. the, the, those guys are interesting because, you know, um, they had developed a whole language for the White Walkers. Scroth, I think it's Scroth. called. Scroth, and yeah. we tried it. And in fact, at the end of season two, before I came on, they, they attempted a yell from him as they, you know, I think people remember that on the, the very last shot. Yeah, exactly. And so when I came on, that was one of the big things. It was difficult. And we tried the scroth, and it just, and I, I kind of, I started really thinking about it, and I came up with the concept that they just are bigger than language, that language was demeaning to them to speak. You know what I mean? In a way, it was just beneath them. They were beyond that. And so my idea became that as they moved, everything froze, and that they had commanded the great forces of nature. They can 
can make the earth crack in two or, or crack the ice or move the mountains. I mean, you can hear it as they arrive. You always know when they're around. And there's something very powerful and primal and mystical and deep about that. And it's, it, it, it works. It's, you know. But it's funny how language did not work for them at all. You know, it, it was just one of those moments. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. You answered the question. Fuck the king.